So I think uh, Gail is going to be a great wrap up to the discussion today. Um, NRAM, um, I go up to her when I have questions about bugs <laughs> and little bitty bugs in the soil system. Really little she's bugs. My, she's my go to when we start talking about the soil biology and stuff and many things. And so with that, Gail, I'll let you kind of introduce yourself once you share uh, your screen and let you run. Did I share? Can you see my screen? Uh, you just did. You can see it? I can see it. How's that? We're good to go. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I'll, actually a lot of what I'll prevent, present today will kind of build in a different way on um, what the previous speakers have talked about. So I'm here at Oklahoma State University. Um, I like Brian said I'm, I'm upstairs from him. So we can connect and ask each other questions. Uh, I've been at Oklahoma State for about 13 years. And before that, I was at Kansas State University. So I've been where Dan was. Uh, most of my research focuses on plant soil microbial interactions and either native grasslands or agricultural systems. Okay, so let's be nice to our soil, right? Because that's where all the good stuff's happening. We know that plants interact with a whole lot of different soil organisms, and the soil organisms in turn enhance the plant's growth, and the plant in influences what soil organisms are in the soil or are, are associated. So to understand how biology affects our soils, we need to like really dig in and, and understand what's going on with these, with these different, um, my, a lot of them microbial organisms. What I'll talk about today is uh, the soil fungi. And in particular, the focus of my research has been on mycorrhizal fungal associations with various plant species. And we know that, just catch you up if you're not, if you don't work with mycorrhizae all the time. Um, this is a symbiotic relationship, meaning that the plant gains benefit and the fungi gain benefit as well. And these are all over the place. I mean, most ecosystems have these associations. Can you guys hear? Yeah, we can hear. We just had somebody uh, go off. Here, so continue on. Okay. <laughs> All right. Somebody out there is uh, not muted. Check yourself. Okay. Harry, check your mic. Nightingale. So, okay. So these these fungal so fungal plant associations are everywhere. Most ecosystems have them, and, and including agricultural systems. Form this uh, mutualistic association with the fungi, and so do most of the grassland plants. Uh, some plants don't. About 90% of plants form a relationship with the mycorrhizae, with that fungi. But there are some, the, the brassicaceae, so uh, garlic mustard or canola, for example, um, broccoli, they do not form a mycorrhizal association. But for most plants, it, the association in low soil is actually critical. So if you look across the native tall grass prairies, our dominant tall grass prairie plants, such as big blue stem, Indian grass, panicum, or switchgrass, they not only form an association with this fungi, but in low nutrient native soil, they cannot live without it. So you see, there is a little plant here, but without the mycorrhizal fungi, these plants cannot complete their life cycle. They, they can't grow at all. And the reason for that is because they have hyphae that these fungal hyphae extend out and they bring back nutrients, especially phosphorus, which is fairly immobile in the soil, but also nitrogen, some micronutrients. In some cases, they bring back water to, from the soils to the plant. 
So the plant is dependent on the fungi for the nutrient uptake. And in exchange, these fungi are 100% dependent on the plants because they get all of their energy or all of their carbon from uh, the plant photosynthate. So the plant shares its photosynthate. So if you notice in, in this um, photo, there's a lot of hyphae in, in especially grassland soils. And in fact, it's estimated that about half of the microbial biomass in agricultural or grassland soils are from these fungi. And of course, it has implications for soil organic carbon or storage. Not only is the biomass of all this fungal hyphae considerable, but the plant um, may increase its photosynthetic rate to help support these fungi down below ground to um, support these symbiotic partners. Some research um, we've done here, this was actually done at Kansas State University when I was there. Uh, we found that if you, you increase or you allow the amount of mycorrhizal hyphae to ex extend in the soil, you have greater formations of macro aggregates. And, and Deanne talked about these and the importance of macro aggregates to a healthy soil. So what we think happens is we get all of this fungi in the soil and in native soils, in a teaspoon of soil, you can have about a hyphae all smooshed in there. And you can imagine how all those hyphal strands will help hold those aggregates together. They help hold them even when they're wet. So they're water stable macro aggregates. And if you picture this, without the mycorrhizae, these aggregates just disintegrate. They're not water stable. They don't hold together. But with all this hyphae sticking them all together, particles together, then you have this macro aggregate stability. And as Deanne said, these macro aggregates are really important, right? They help keep uh, other organisms in the soil. They include increased porosity. They increase water holding capacity. So for healthy soils, it's really important to have these macro aggregates. And we found that this similar increase in hyphal abundance is related to increases in soil organic carbon. And as I explained earlier, part of that is because of an increase in microbial biomass. Part of that is because the plant is shuttling carbon down below ground to support these microbes. Okay, so a lot of these hyphae is a good thing. Can we manage to preserve these hyphae? And is there, are there management practices that maybe we harm these organisms? Well, if we talk today, tillage is possibly not the best mechanism if you want to increase if is the previous slides you saw these are like tubes that run all through if you till you chop up those two those those threads if you chop them up then they're not there to help the plant take nutrients fertilization can decrease mycorrhizal fungi because remember this is a symbiotic relationship and if the plant is giving carbon to the fungi which I then take up nutrients. The plant doesn't have any reason to share its carbon if there's lots of nutrients. It doesn't need the fungi to take up these nutrients. So it will reduce the amount of carbon that it shares with the fungi and it'll reduce the amount of um, fungal biomass that's in the soil. Uh, fallow, of course, that would have an effect, right? Because the fungi, 100% of its carbon comes from the plant. If there's no plant there, that's gonna be detrimental to the fungal community or the fungal abundance. And in pesticide, herb, uh, fungicides obviously have a negative effect, right? If you're gonna kill fungi, you're gonna kill these symbiotic fungi as well. So just to sum up the, the tillage, to reiterate that, that tillage really is not good for these soil microorganisms. If they're good, can we harness that? Can we, 
Can we use these processes for maybe production with less fertilizer additions or less water additions? That's kind of where the research in my lab is, is extended to right now. It, why do we want to increase these nutrients, nutrient addition? Well, it's a limited resource. It's expensive. It's expensive for the producers. If we add on too much nitrogen, we know that a lot of it is lost and that's not good for our waterways. And these fungi take up nutrients, right? They take up phosphorus and nitrogen for the plant. So maybe if we increase the plant's ability to take up natural mechanisms of the symbiosis, maybe we can add less nitrogen, the same tissue quality or the same production each year from our crops. Some work I did, at, early work we did at, at K-State, we found that there is a linkage, there's a genetic inheritance between um, the crop or the host plant and the fungi. And we found that ancient land races often responded very positively to the mycelial fungi, where the modern cultivars of wheat tended to respond negatively, even in low pea soils. So our hypothesis was that perhaps while we were breeding for greater grain production, we inadvertently turned off those genetics that uh, for that has allowed the plant to form this association with these beneficial fungi. So we thought, well, if it works for wheat, what about other crops? So we, we went into sorghum, which is an uh, expanding crop here in Oklahoma, partly because it's uh, drought tolerant. And breeders have done a great job. So if you see enough, that's an early cultivar that has not been um, under, has not undergone very much modern uh, breeding. And it has been breeded. It's improved the yield, it's improved the disease resistance. So it's giving us more crop and in a limited amount of space we have available for crop production. So we're not bashing on the breeders, but we are working with breeders right now to say, let's look at the blow ground trays while we breed. Let's take into account um, some of the genetics and see if we breed, can breed crops to use this um, symbiosis instead of just fertilizers. And we found that very similar to the wheat, that the roots of the, of the, ain't, of the early land races of sorghum were highly colonized by mycorrhizal fungi and lower nutrient soil they produced greater production of grain compared to the modern hybrids. And the modern hybrids were very responsive to fertilizer, much more so than the earlier genotypes. So, but the production was equivalent. And we found that increased colonization, so the plants that had higher levels of mycorrhizae affiliated with them, had higher levels of protein in their grain. They had more grain and higher protein. And then they also had higher phosphorus, higher zinc, iron, and some of those micronutrients that can be very important, especially in developing nations where they have a propensity of low um, iron and low zinc in their diets. Because the earlier cultivars had mycorrhizal fungi associated with them. Of course, that also leads to greater soil aggregate stability and soil uh, organic carbon. So can we breed plants? Can we work with breeders to, to breed for plants that are equivalent in biomass production and yet um, could use less fertilization and improve the quantity or, and, of mycorrhizal fungi in the soil. Well, our work with switchgrass, we are working with breeders in switchgrass, nutrient breeding conditions, we can increase the mycorrhizal dependence through breeding. Okay, so a lot of these fungi are a good thing. 
And Dan mentioned that sometimes she's asked, should we add microbes to our soil? Well, I get asked, should we add inoculum to the soil? I mean, you can buy commercial mycorrhizal fungi anywhere on the, on the web. And I recommend you don't do that. Um, restoration and management pra uh, practitioners often ask in, its, in some cases, the soil is so disturbed, there aren't mycorrhizal fungi. But typically in agricultural soils, you still have these benefits. They're, the quantity is less. So if you add these commercial in, in, inoculum, often they're not native. Um, often they're just species that sporulate very readily. So they're not necessarily beneficial to the plant. We don't know if we're adding kudzu below ground, right? They're microscopic, so it's really hard to follow these guys. And a lot of times they come in just really high nutrient medium. So it looks like you're helping the plant because you're adding on a lot of nitrogen and phosphorus, but you're really just adding fertilizer. So does it really matter? Are fungi fungi? Are they the same everywhere? We examined mycorrhizae in what we call a home and away where we had three sites, one from Illinois, one from Kansas, and one from Minnesota. And we mixed these all up. So we put plant, fungi, and soil, and it was considered home, home, home. If it was Kansas soil, Kansas plants, and Kansas soil, and, and Kansas fungi. And the plant we used here was big blue stem. But we found that the plants grew best when they were with their own fungi on their own soil. So they produced more. The fungi did better, it produced more fungi, the productive structures. So it does seem important that we have to take into consideration where we're getting these fungi from. So I think we need to understand the plant soil microbial associations and that'll help with especially if we want to think about reducing some of our input, which, you know, reducing our input doesn't just help protect the environment. It's also cost effective for the producers. I think that, now, other questions? Did I go too fast? Did I not go too fast? <clears throat> Did I go too fast? No, you did not. It, the audio was a bit glitchy, but I think we uh, still got the overall uh, take on. I think it was a great call. Um, I have trouble with my laptop, but I ordered a new one. Okay. Um, we got plenty of time for the roundtable discussion. Uh, does anybody have any direct questions for Dr. Wilson before we kind of move it around, uh, move around to the group? Gail, if you could unshare your screen, we'll kind of go back to. Did I unshare it? Uh, no, you're still sharing, but I can. How's that? There we go. That works good. All right. We still have all of our presenters online. Uh, does anybody have any opening questions? Uh, it could be to a specific speaker or to be to the group as a whole. Let me start it off. I'm sure it will be a lot of questions after this. So from the presentation, the presentation I was at wondering, um, maybe Brian, you can do this or, or, or Gail, either one, but specifically with wheat cultivars in no-till, do you see, we're seeing some differences in nitrogen use efficiencies and, and other nutrient efficiencies in those different cultivars. Have we been able to demonstrate that that might be mycorrhizal? Uh, some of those uh, modern varieties have still have some dependence on some mycorrhizal that, that others have not. Yeah, the modern varieties with the mycorrhizae. Um, what we think is that they may have, have lower uh, propensities to form that association than the older um, ancestors, but they still do form mycorrhizae. And even in agricultural fields, the, the abundance of the fungi will be reduced, but they'll still be present. Jimmy on the oh, side. Yeah, it could be. 
on the stuff we've done with nitrogen and phosphorus. That black water is not fixed. I called Randy again this morning. He thinks maybe he can get it this week. So. Okay, I just muted somebody. Um, uh, Jimmy, on the nitrogen and, and variety stuff we've done with the new cultivars, nitrogen and phosphorus. On phosphorus, it's very much related, not completely, but very much related to aluminum toxicity. So the those cultivars that are more aluminum tolerant tend to have a compensity to be better phosphorus use efficiency. It's not perfect, but overall those, and those that are not aluminum tolerant, but really good at P, uh, have the capability to release more uh, organic acids, which may stimulate mycorrhizae fungi or may just stimulate the release of phosphorus, you know, either way. On the nitrogen side, uh, everything I've seen is all about the root system. I can drive every one of those cultivars back to be good NUE. They're also good water UE, and they have more below ground biomass than above ground. That that root to shoot ratio is shifted on those good NUE plants. That also could also be with the mycorrhizae fungi that you get it that much bigger, but that's what I've seen. Uh, we have not gone directly to look at the cultivars to see how well they are uh, correlated with that. I'm going to go back to the nitrogen side. I'll, uh, from the, and this was from uh, Josh Lofton. If we get more efficient, and I have data to, to back my answer up, so I want to get the, everybody out there to get their opinion first. Um, if we get more efficient at our nitrogen management, are we going to likely draw down organic matter? Does the, does the group want to take that or you want me to share the, the long-term data? Sounds like you should go ahead, then we can pick you apart. So, so what we found, that's a great question. What we found is that um, in a lot of the long-terms, we've been sampling these long-terms, they're, they're 10 year to 15 year no-till in by P. We've also got crop rotation is that with increasing nitrogen rate, we have a dramatic increase in organic carbon. It is a, a very linear increase until you get to about optimum rate and you have a slight increase above optimum. And I think we'd probably see some of the stuff with uh, what Dorovar's done uh, up at Kansas and maybe what Lolato has up in Kansas, but it's really about the biomass production. So as long as we're increasing biomass production, we can increase that organic carbon. But the point at which you stop increasing biomass with additional nitrogen, you stop. But you really start telling off once you get to about that op uh, optimum end rate as far as uh, grain production, you start slowing down your increase of organic carbon with increasing nitrogen. So you can go a little bit more, uh, but not much less. And I'll look at the stuff we've done on the sensors. We had 10 years of sensor-based management, which reduced the overall nitrogen application by 50% but maintain nitrogen. And then this was in a tilled system, so we don't have that. But the organic carbon was not changed between the sensor-based and the high end rate. It was still above that of a marginal or low end rate. So if we, if we look at that, then no. As long as we're doing optimum nitrogen, we're not going to reduce organic matter. Could we potentially have a little bit less if we don't over fertilize? Yeah. But do you want, like Gail said, do you want to lose more by over fertilizing just to get an extra tenth of percent of carbon? Or do you want to be more uh, effective and efficient in your system? Now, Mark Gregory had a good question on uh, the chat, and Gail went ahead and answered. But, Gail, can you kind of tell the group out loud? If my audio works, sure. <laughs> Now, he asked if, if the high temperature, when you fallow, of course, the soil temperature is increased. And hey, also, yeah. okay, so, so the temperature of the soil is increased and the soil moisture is often reduced. So does that affect the fungi? Yes. Um, a big loss in moisture, they'll desiccate. And um, on high temperatures, then you know, that's detrimental to them. But the biggest problem with fallow is they don't get any of their energy. They don't have any of their carbon from the, they have to get all of their carbon from the plant. And if there's no plant there, they, they just fall and wait for a plant. But a lot of times that means their hyphae are, are going to desiccate. 
Um, you know, all fungi don't do that. Saprophytic fungi can have the capability to break down organic matter and get energy that way, right? But the mycorrhizal fungi can't. Now, I don't know how many of you caught it in Gail's talk, but she, she put in something specific for me because I've requested it multiple times. The comment we always get about, about uh, bringing in organisms, whether it's fungi or microalgae, or trust me, we've all seen a significant list of things that we can add to our soils. I've heard Gail and others in NREM talk about it, is that you know we through agriculture and other systems have brought in some amazing plants to benefit our, our cropping systems, like kudzu, like multifloral rose, like Cerisia lespediza, like old world blue stem, uh, uh, big blue, like all these things we brought in to better ourselves that are now invasive bad species. Are we potentially doing the same thing with some of these additives that we're bringing in that are non-native species of fungi or mycorrhizae or other aspects? Uh, and I've had Gail kind of speak about that. Uh, Deanne, others, what would you, Deanne, you're more along that side. What would you say about that? Deanne's sharing, so she has something in mind. You're muted, Deanne. There we go. Sorry, I'm in that uh, neverland of having too many screens open right now. Oh, kick it to the right one. Okay, that'll work. All right, you just froze, Deanne, or did we lose her? Oh, she's still there. We do not have you. I don't know what Deanne's saying. We've lost her. Okay. Ooh, there we go. There you are. Back <laughs> Sorry, home. I froze for a second there. Sit, hit me with it one more time, Brian. What'd you say? I, I'm just saying we lost you. So go ahead with what you've got. You're showing. Well, I forgot to say this earlier, but there's this new, um, you know, I like DIY things. And there's this new app. So again, you know, the whole like dropping peds of different soil and water and shaking up and see what happens. There's this app that's new and it's only in the Google Play Store, but you can, um, you can, it takes a 10, it's a 10 minute image that it takes of your soil falling apart in water. And then it um, puts some kind of number on it. So I haven't actually tried it. I'm going to do it this winter to a few hundred samples and see what I think of it. But, and it's something anybody can use. I think of it's it's similar, you know, it reminds me of the Canapeo app, Citizen Science. You can try it out yourself, see if you like it. Um, and it's, uh, it'd take your time, but it's cheaper than sending samples to a lab. So I just thought I'd mention that. It's called the Slakes app. All right. Um, so Paul, have you seen Anything along the lines of what Josh and we've seen as far as any any interaction with weed, weed management, and such things? We haven't quantified it um, at this point, but um, we should and could. But, um, you know, there's definitely advantage of having a cover crop over leaving it fallow. And that's, that's apparent. Um, I guess sometimes, you know, I like to, we like to think that we're getting complete weed control, which isn't going to be um, possible, but we do see uh, reduced weed pressure over fallow and then um, a few weeks into the year. And um, I would say, you know, rye has done well, of course, and wheat. And then um, early on, um, the vine growing cover crops like a vetch or a, a winter pea, it's has very good biomass production and completely covers and smothers everything out. That gives us more of a short-term effect. Of course, that residue goes away very quickly and then we have some weeds come on after that. But we have we have seen some things similar to what Josh um, showed today. Well, guys, we got about four minutes left on our time. Is there any, um, any if there's no more questions and please feel free to jump in with a question on chat or is there anything that, that you guys might have been triggered about by another speaker. Any last comments you have uh, before I share the uh, CCA uh, login and people start leaving? I'll take 
that is a no. So I'll share my screen. Uh, so so let me let me ask Gail, you know, going back to that adding non-native populations to the soil. Uh, we do that all the time with inoculum uh, because Oklahoma does not have native soybean inoculum present in enough populations to sustain a, a soybean crop. Uh, and we find that they just can't sustain in the soil. Uh, so would that be the same thing with these added mycorrhizae that it's a one year thing uh, or because it, it is more aggressive potentially, would it, would it be able to take over native populations? What, what do you think would happen more? So what you add with the soybean is rhizobium, right? Yeah, so the, the, we don't really know, Josh, the, the um, non, so some of these, the soil inoculum or mycorrhizal inoculum you can get off the web are obviously not from the US. They're, they're from other areas and often they're selected because in, they, they transport well, right? They can go in an artificial media and not die. They use spores mostly. Which are their little, you know, the little reproductive structure. What they select for is our fungi that have make a lot of spores, because you want to have a lot of inoculum with a little input, right? But that's totally fungal centric. The spores that doesn't necessarily, you're not selecting for species or taxa that special to the plant, and we don't know if you add. Those are they going to be like kudzu that take over and and you know outcompete the native fungi? We don't really know, but I do know that we have found that when you put plants where they don't belong, it's not always met with what we want. And plants are hard enough to get rid of when you can actually see them. It's still really hard to get rid of invasive. Probes that we can't even really see that well. So I think maybe we should just not even go down that road. Well, and and Brian can cut me off at any time, but Gail, there's there's been a big uh, discussion point on how treating with inoculum slash the soil fungi or or native rhizo or uh, rhizosphere are affected by seed treatment fungicides and seed treatment insecticides on, on whether there's any impact or not. And so uh, I didn't know if you had any comments on seed treatment for fungicides and all, if, if uh, you thought there was a major impact in rhizosphere communities or, or you know, non. I, I could be wrong, but I think that the fungicides they put on the seed coat is, is, has a really short lifespan, life effect on the soil, right, time? Uh, some can, so, I mean, some can be present for a, a decent amount. I mean, it depends on what you consider long term. For a crop system, 30, 30 days is pretty long for us, you know, not, not necessarily for, you know, the, the life of the soil. Well, I was thinking short term like days. So it probably doesn't have, you know, days or a week. It probably doesn't have that large effect. But fungicides, if you, you know, obviously they'll have an effect on the fungi because you're trying to get rid of the pathogens, but the mycorrhizal fungi are going to be affected as well. So we'd have to really look into that. I don't, I don't know that anyone has looked at that. Well, the, the argument is there's not as much AMF in that top uh, inch, you know, that, that you're reliant on that is, uh, you know, where the seed treatment ends. But then the counter argument is, there is. <laughs> so it's, you know, where that species distribution is in the, in the soil profile, you know, that I think more than a temporal short term, it's a, it's a, a spatial short term of, of how far that goes in the soil is very small. Uh, you know, it's, it's how much interaction does it have with native fungi and if a well-established AMF could be hindered by a, a small dose fungicide on the seed. Well, I would argue that the majority of the of all the microbial activity, including mycorrhizal fungi, are in that top layer of the soil, and where the root fine roots sort of the crop. But most crops have relatively shallow fine root systems, and so the the actively growing fine roots are. 
So I, I would argue that they are in that top inch. Yeah, that that's a very highly contested, and and I think you're right. I don't I don't know if anybody has that data. I think a lot of people are making comments without it being known. But it's interesting. It's a it's an interesting concept to think. You, there are a lot of studies where I mean, like six feet, eight feet down, you still find mycorrhizal fungi, but the abundance is the going to be on that top active layer where everybody else is active, right? <laughs> For the CCAs that are on their phone and unable to, to take an image, if they send me uh, their information, their email or contact me, I can send you the slide with that uh, barcode or I can get you signed in. For any of you guys that need it and can't reach it, I've had a couple of people text, so let, let me know. Uh, with that, we're at 1030. We can continue on, but I'd greatly appreciate the time from our presenters. I think this is a great diversity from both geographic and in background, and I thought the conversations were great. I've already had some people uh, time in, speakers, that they really appreciated the what you guys have talked about and, um, and have more. Um, yeah, Jimmy, Jimmy's just saying he has more questions. You can always ask questions, Jimmy, so, so jump right in. But um, I appreciate it. Uh, if there's any other time, the speakers may have a couple sure. to jump in, but this is the official end of our time. So thank you, Deanne. Thank you, Gail. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Josh. I really enjoyed all your topics. I enjoyed all your discussions. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. This was fun. It was nice to see everybody. Yeah, good to see you, Gail. Yeah. Do you want us to hang out for a second, see if there's any questions that come in? Just hold for a couple. Okay. Uh, but... Damn, yeah. It keeps clicking off every time you move. There we go. That's funny. I keep, Wilson, I keep shutting you off intentionally. <laughs> not, not Gail, the other Wilson. Well, I don't see anybody uh, necessarily hanging on for any questions, guys. Feel free to pop off and go do your thing. I appreciate it. By the way, we had a total of the high end, we had uh, 54, not counting us, and the low end, we had 50. So we really maintained in that 50 active uh, participants the entire time, all two hours. Sorry, my audio checked out. That's all right. No, I ordered this new computer, and apparently, because of COVID, there's a big mass of people trying to get computers. So Jessica told me I it she told me it would be the middle of November. Now it's the end of December. So I'm sorry I had to get up and make my dog be quiet right in the middle. Like he just <laughs> I have a very I got a pandemic dog and he is hyper. <laughs> So. A pandemic dog? That's a dog you rescued during the pandemic? <laughs> yeah, well, my, so I had a, my dog died in March, like my, my dog, and uh, my kids have dogs too, it's a mess around here. So in about July, I just started, I got really bummed, because my dog would have really enjoyed the whole pandemic, my old dog, she would have enjoyed that. So I went and got one, and he's a disaster. <laughs> I love him, but he's a, he's a hot mess, and so I need to go like run him right now. <laughs> Deanne, I am a little disappointed that you did not stream live from an excavation pit today. Oh, you are I certified did. now, so Hell I was yeah. expecting it. OSHA certified. <laughs> You're a big guy. Yeah, um, yeah. There's a story behind that too. Uh, so the reason I had to go. And I don't even know. I think I've done four excavator and excavation classes now. It's because I got in trouble. So, for your pits or your home activity? Um, I just we have a safety person that got upset with me, so mm -hmm. I had to go to school, and so now I'm out of excavator jail. I can dig whatever I want wherever I want. So. <laughs> This, this was you run an excavator on your own property and you got in trouble? It was, in fact, yes. But she didn't really have any authority, but she said she did. did. So she just uh, wrote a bunch of tattletale emails to, like, you know, the big bosses and stuff. So now I have a sworn enemy. <laughs> 
on your own property, you got in trouble for digging a pit? <laughs> so I have an excavator and I have an acreage. So I dug a soil pit at my house in the backyard and I just posted about it on social media and about four articles have been written about it now because people just think that's interesting, I guess. And so after those articles got published, the safety person said, you're not allowed to dig your own pits because you haven't had excavator training. And I was like, I mean, the fact that I can dig it makes me feel like I can do it, you know, like, fine, 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 fine. And, and your excavator, right? It's not like it belongs to Kansas State. Correct. But because I used it for teaching purposes, the video it was, it needed to, the only thing she really ever got me on was the fact that a competent person had not looked at it and blessed it. So, which makes me wonder what she would do if she could get her hands on every, you know, soil pit that we do for our pur like teaching purposes, right? Or contests. So now that you've been to school, are you that competent person that can show up and know that you're not going to kill anybody? Yes, I'm competent. So now you're competent. I'm OSHA competent. <laughs> My teacher at the class was interesting, though, because he goes, sugar clay, that's a word you use, right? And I was like, what is sugar clay? I mean, everybody says sugar sand. I got that, you know, but about sugar clay. Huh. So anyway, after thinking about this for about a day, we decided that and then eventually we went to the field. He meant like um, silt. <laughs> silt or like a silt loam like that's just really silty. So this was in Nebraska where they have a lot of really silty, you know, like light silt loam soils. So he meant like silt loam parent material because, you know, you get it on your hands and it crumbles apart and you go like this and, you know, you clap and it just goes everywhere on mine. So it was actually 24 hours of pure torture. That's what it was, to be honest with you. That's awesome. It was three days. It All was right, a three-day class. Shut her down. <laughs> That's awesome, man. Bye. We'll talk to you guys okay. later. Have a good one. Bye. Bye.